I got the reason those bastards in the warship came here, Baxter said. And what is that? They want meat, Admiral, and it looks like we're it. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Sound and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I am Tina. Today I'm doing a book review of <laughs> Armada by Michael John. This is, or Jan, I don't know. This is a sci-fi, a classic sci-fi from 1981 from Fawcett Books. I read this book for the Dessertathon, and it gets me flour, which I got for reading a favorite genre. As you know, classic science fiction is a favorite genre of mine. As usual with my classic sci-fi reviews, I'm going to do a spoiler-free review at the start, and then I'm going to do my classic bingo chart at the end, where I go through kind of everything in this book. It's gone now. Uh, <laughs> that I found relevant or interesting. So, what is the book about? I guess I need a book. In the year 1995... High above Earth in starlit velvet blackness, three people encounter one of man's greatest hopes and most terrifying fears, intelligent alien life. Nathaniel Broadsword, the ruggedly handsome space shuttle captain, Margot Chambers, his strong, sensual co-pilot, and Curtis Baxter, the irascible loner who thought he'd left Earth's problem behind him long ago. They want adventure, and they'll get it, with the discovery of a great mass hurtling towards Earth. Soon, much too soon, it is close enough to be identified. A ship. A battleship. Ten miles long. No communication can raise it. No pleas for peace can stop it. They call it Armada, and its purpose is suddenly, frighteningly clear. The plot is pretty basic, but where the story really shines is the characters. Broadsword and Baxter are fine, but Chambers is awesome. <laughs> um, she's a mouthy pilot in her 30s, and she isn't afraid to tell it as it is. Her reaction to things had me laughing quite a few times. Broadsword is kind of a jerk in how he treats his girlfriend, but it's great that he's an indigenous man character who doesn't fall under stereotypes. I also like that Leslie, his girlfriend, has a real job and purpose in the story. She's not just kind of there like sometimes girlfriends in these books are. Uh, Baxter, the other character, he's fine. He's kind of a typical rough around the edges old soldier guy. So he, if you like that trope, he's he's definitely fulfills that for you. <laughs> the aliens are very simple, and we learn that Lex. Ugh. And we learn next to nothing about them, but this was the start of an era where, like, humanity brought together by an external threat trope, which we see in Independence Day in the 90s and then parodied in Starship Troopers. There are tons of books, especially tons of books about this, as well as, like, lots of kind of low-budget movies about this as well. Uh, but what we get of the aliens in this story is entertaining and pretty fun, especially the ending. <laughs> The book is also fun in its predictions about the future. Space station habitations in 15 years is a pretty lofty goal. <laughs> I talk a lot more about kind of the technology in the book in my in the spoiler part, but that was one of the best things about the book was was all the tech because it was so much fun because some of it you're just like Oh my god. And others are just like, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Where the book really excels, though, is pacing and ease of reading. I flew through this book in like an afternoon, as it was so easy to read. The language was clear and simple, but descriptive, and the story moves at a great pace. The action scenes were pretty good, though they kind of, there's less of them than you'd think would be in a book about an attacking alien force. The plausibility of the solution is kind of silly, but oh well. <laughs> Overall, it's a classic sci-fi that deserves the classic term, as it's still an absolute blast to read. I highly recommend it. Honestly, if someone's going to ask me how do I get into classic science fiction, I would suggest Armada. So now I'm going to jump into my classic sci-fi bingo, which is full of spoilers, but it's a lot of fun. If you want to read this book, uh, please do, and then come back, I guess. <laughs> or if you have read it, stay tuned and you'll get a little refresher of the fun stuff in Armada. So there it is, one of these sides. <laughs> outdated science. Yes, <laughs> there is a ton of outdated science in this book. There's an astronomer who uses photographs of stars rather than just like using a tablet or a computer. Like he has these like physical photographs. I'm just like, okay. Um, there's tapes playing from wall speakers. At one point, Broadsword and Haskins, uh, his girlfriend, are riding the elevator to the rim. Their arms full of tape cassettes, computer printouts, and film canisters. Yep, you're living in a space station, but you're still using film canisters. Same thing, Leslie is one of the communications techs, and uh, she, she's like the communication tech of the space station. And she showed they're going to like a different, they're going to a shuttle. And she had with her a large briefcase packed with code books and computer printouts. So it's just like, gotta print out all those pages. And I like this part because it's funny. NASA experts called it the biggest explosion in this corner of the universe since the supernova that ended the age of the dinosaurs 70 million years earlier. 
I don't think John knew here what a supernova was because if our sun had gone supernova, we wouldn't have our sun anymore. So I don't know <laughs> what he's talking about. <laughs> And one major thing for the outdated science. So the way they discover how to kill the aliens is that a woman was saved from being dissolved um, by the aliens because that's what they do. They basically like break you down and eat you, turn you into slurry. I don't know. Because she was standing near a microwave oven that was presumably running, which hurt the aliens enough that they left. This doesn't make any sense <laughs> because the microwaves produced inside the microwave oven are absorbed by the food and produce the heat that cooks the food. They aren't emitted outside of the oven. Likewise, electromagnetic radiation is a type of energy that is around us and takes many forms such as radio waves, microwaves, x-rays, and gamma rays. Sunlight is a form of electromagnetic energy, electromagnetic energy. So unless the aliens couldn't go outside at all, which they do, they do go outside, so this is obviously not true. This makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> there was a lot of misconceptions about microwaves in the 1980s, a lot. My mother still thinks that the microwave will give you like a disease. I don't know. So uh, next one, spaceships blowing up or crashes, yep. This happens a lot. The explosion that I just talked about a couple of pages ago, the one that apparently mimics that that killed dinosaurs, uh, was Armada blowing up. Uh, number three, predicting social changes. Not really. Women are still rare in the military and nothing else is really different. We don't see society at large pretty much at all. So I wouldn't say that there's a lot of changes culturally. The Soviet Union is still around too. And the main space forces are the US and the Soviet Union. China has nothing. So um, obviously he didn't predict anything <laughs> that has happened. Sexy female scientist. No, because the two sexy ladies are a comm technician and a pilot. <laughs> cool aliens. Eh, I'm kind of on the fence about this. They aren't in it very much and nothing about their ship is overly cool. I'll describe it to you. It looked like the biggest battleship of World War II, only glued keel to keel to a twin and enlarged a hundredfold. What seemed from a distance like an arrowhead was the largest warship imaginable, with fighting decks on top and bottom and along each side a row of mammoth ports. What looked from a distance of 50,000 miles like a window across the bow was a gigantic painted symbol resembling a streak of lightning but meant no doubt to be the gaping maw of a shark. I, I don't know why they would paint a shark mouth on their ship. <laughs> Is it in the picture? No, it's not in the picture. <laughs> so not really cool. I, honestly, it's not that, dis it's not described very well, to be honest. I kind of imagine what it looked like because of the picture. Another thing about the alien. So here's what they look like. The alien was propped against the other wall, his helmet off, blue green bloods pouring from a leg wound. He was tall, about six feet, two inches, humanoid with exaggerated features and pasty white skin covered all over with fine black hairs. The hair on his head was short cropped and looked like a skull cap. I, so he basically just looks kind of like a human. It's kind of lame. <laughs> One of the interesting things actually about the aliens is the fact that their goals is not to like take over humanity, things like that. Their goals is to eat humans. They, they basically land it over a city and they send in their, their people and their robots and they basically just fire these guns at people and turn them into like, I guess like s suck up all their meat. I don't know. But <laughs> this is a line about it that I think is very funny. I got the reason those bastards in the warship came here, Baxter said. And what is that? They want meat, Admiral. And it looks like we're it. <laughs> so funny. Maybe I'll give this one just for that line because <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, let's see. Next. Alien human romance. Nope. Generation ship. Nope. Space soldiers. No. AI robots. Not really. New worlds. No. Cyberpunk. No. Blatant sexism. No, for several reasons that I'm going to talk about because <laughs> it's really fun. So Marco Chambers is awesome. As I said, she's mouthy, she's determined, she has goals in life, and is as fleshed out as the male characters. She's sexual agency, she initiates the sex scene, and she honestly is so much fun. She also figures out how to kill the aliens. Like, Margo is a huge part of the story. I've got some fun lines for Margo because Margo is my hero. Jesus, she snarled. You're as bad as Baxter. Two goddamn prima donnas. What did I do to get saddled with both of you? <laughs> that the men are talking about uh, leaving the Space Force to become private mining operators, basically. And she goes, she's not me, old man. I'm coming with you two. What? Baxter exclaimed. That's right. I'm going to fly the Columbia while you two fucks float around in space, chipping away at rocks. 
And this is my favorite. So, you got my number one lady in there, broadsword, Baxter went on. I gotta make sure she's safe. Tell him to get stuffed, Margo said. <laughs> she's just so funny. Uh, Margo also complains about sexism in the military. Damn it, I'm the only woman pilot in the shuttle service. There's only room for one. And if I leave, there's no way I'm coming back. That little bitch Jenny Dinkins will be up from Kennedy so fast it'll make your head spin. Then what the hell will I do? There'll be no coming back for me. It's unfortunate, like this is completely accurate, to the time period at least. It's unfortunate John couldn't, John couldn't imagine a world like Starship Troopers, the movie, or, you know, Alien or Aliens like Vasquez and Ripley, but at least he's addressing the issue and he's also highlighting how constricting her career goals can be because she has to consider if she'll lose her spot as the one woman. You know, if she loses her job, she can't get another one because they'll only allow one woman in the military. And this is not something that is a unique concept. This happened a lot in the 80s. They're like, oh yeah, we'll put one in there, you know, one here, one there for like PR purposes. But, you know, there's only one. You only need one woman. You know, only one woman's good enough. And she probably has to be like 100% grade, things like that, where you've got guys who probably scored like 65% on their tests, things like that. Anyway, uh... I just thought it was really interesting that John would bring this up and <laughs> as it's something that still has repercussions today. So Margot dies. At first, it seems like fridging. This is where they kill off a female character to further a man's plot. The reason it has a name is because it's a lazy way to create a character arc and it happens all of the time and it's very frustrating. Yet, in some instances, like in this book, it's not fridging. Margot's death does spur more action, but she also solves the problem of the aliens before it happens. Margot's death doesn't spur anything. They were already going to fight the aliens. Broadsword was already determined, and she, she had already figured out the problem. So it's not like anyone kind of stole that from her. It was actually more tragic, and this is how a female story arc should be if she's a secondary ca ca character, that her death doesn't, you know, inspire terrible heartache and blah, 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 but it, it inspires the loss of a friend, of someone you care about. And Baxter and Broadsword talk about her on the last page, saying how much they miss her friendship. And I thought that was really, really good and really rare for a book from the 80s, because usually it's the, like, you know... Um, Mel Gibson type <laughs> kind of revenge story but no this is not that and I I was really surprised and and pleasantly surprised by it. I also liked that Leslie while very different from Margot and far younger also has more of a role in the story than just the love interest. She's the main airspace controller for the space station so she's a woman in STEM and that's pretty cool and she's firm about her needs from Baxter in a relationship and has a quiet strength for someone so young and I thought that it was great that we didn't have just like the one cocky female character we had two and they were very different and both were both had their strengths in the story. What's next? Um, spaceship. Yep, definitely that. <laughs> Forerunner technology. No. LGBTQ plus representation. Nope. <laughs> Portals or black holes. Nope. Microfiche. Ah, no. It's not mentioned directly. I mean, the film canisters could be microfiche, but they could also be video film. So it wasn't referenced. Oh, oh, oh. So the male MC being a bit of a dick. I'm going to say yes, but only because of how Broadsword cheats on Leslie with Margot and never owns up to it. It adds this real unlikable aspect to Broadsword that I didn't think we needed in the story. The sex scene, while Margot initiates it, 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 that was good, felt forced in that regard, though, as if it were there just to have another sex scene. I didn't think it furthered their relationship or Broadsword's relationship with Leslie at all. It felt kind of useless, and it did make Broadsword out to be... A bit of a dick because cheating on someone makes you a dick. <laughs> Racial equality. I'm going to say yes because Broadsword is indigenous. He mentioned which tribe he's from at 1.2, which I can't remember, <laughs> meaning John doesn't lump all the, you know, native people together, which is good because usually people in, in stories like that, they just assume everyone's from the same tribe. He's also described as... Being the first Native American in space was enough uh, was enough accomplishment. Broadsword had become NASA's top pilot, and both he and Margot were celebrities back on Earth. Part of the reason for his fame was his looks. He knew he was impossibly good looking. <laughs> the rest of the book doesn't really tell you anybody's race, so I will give John the benefit of the doubt here and assume that some of the other soldiers and people are people of color, but we don't specifically know. <laughs> 
Margo does make some off-color jokes to Broadsword, but it seemed more like friendly banter between friends than her being racist. Not that ex that excuses those types of jokes, but in the 80s, those are pretty common. <laughs> Plasma or other future weapons. There are a lot of future weapons specifically. Apparently, they have a way of extracting the available nutrients from human flesh almost instantaneously. Some sort of machine or ray. And it's not just human flesh. If you look at the skeletons, the scorched area around each is devoid of life. Even the microorganisms in the soil are gone. That's the alien weapon, obviously. And then the deuterium fluoride laser mounted on the nose of the Ark Royal just above and behind the retro engines was said to be capable of punching a 10 inch diameter hole in half inch thick steel at a range of 2,500 miles. So I've got pretty powerful guns there. <laughs> That's on top of a bunch of other weapons as well. Uh, next, post-apocalyptic? Nope. Bounty hunters or assassins? Nope. Galactic war? Yep, definitely. <laughs> Tech similar to today? So this is like if there's cell phones or something, like he managed to like prophesize that. <laughs> so there is solar power. So in the direction of the Earth, the bright bulk of Solar Collector 1 appeared as a brilliant star as it beamed the sun's energy to a station in Nebraska. So I thought that was pretty cool that they're using solar technology. <laughs> Too bad we don't actually do that. And... He had on his lap a device the size of a small typewriter with keys and a personal monitor. It was attached by cable to a large console near the bed at which sat a technician working a large keyboard with a full-size monitor. So they have some kind of a laptop here, which is kind of cool. <laughs> there were some funny stuff too. There were wrist, wrist radios, I guess, where people would communicate using their, their, their watch. That was kind of fun. And then pneumatic tubes, because we all know in the 80s, everyone was obsessed with pneumatic tubes and they thought that would be the future. So there's a bunch of that as well. Does this pass the Bechtel test? Yes. <laughs> Leslie and Margot exchange hellos at the start. Ooh. But they're also described as chatting at a dinner party about the Oscars and getting along. And I thought that was, that was, that was great. <laughs> quick, quick bonus. There are no reptile aliens, no female MC, and there's no convergent evolution in this book, unfortunately. Bonus, though, there is a reference to Star Wars. <laughs> this gif. <laughs> that was awesome. And I laughed quite a bit. So, uh, yeah, that's my kind of overview of Armada, all the fun stuff in it. I really liked this book. I love it. And uh, I'm going to keep it forever. So thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments if you read this book and if you'd enjoyed it as well. So thanks.